Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted today to be welcoming Sherry Byrne Haber, who is leading the accessibility work at VMware. VMware is a very large IT company that you may or may not have heard of, um, but they specialize in virtualization, which is um, essentially creating a um, PC inside of uh, another PC. Um, so uh, you're running stuff on servers, uh, and it's a way that a lot of organizations uh, are enabling people to have access to computing without it all being on the local machine. So virtualization is um, something that's used a lot, um, and it presents some interesting challenges for, for accessibility. So I'm really pleased that we've got someone like Sherry who is working on these challenges. So welcome, Sherry. Ah, thank you for having me. You know, VMware's motto is any device, anywhere, anytime. So that's kind of how virtualization can be summed up. Great, and thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm choking here. Um, so I, I, I know you've you've got a long and illustrious career in in accessibility. So uh, and you didn't start at VMware. So can you tell us how you you came to be working in the field? Sure. So I frequently describe myself as having the perfect storm of a background for being in accessibility. I started off with a degree in computer science. Of doing software testing, um, I decided to go to law school, uh, thinking that I was going to uh, do intellectual property and software patents and all that really, you know, super important stuff for Silicon Valley. Um, my third year of law school, we discovered that my daughter was losing her hearing. And so instead of going into intellectual property, I ended up going into advocacy for the deaf. So I did that for eight years, uh, took down a number of insurance companies and school districts for discriminating against people who are deaf. Uh, I won a fairly significant class action against Blue Cross and uh, basically put myself out of business because once Blue Cross caves, everybody else follows. So I was thinking then about, OK, well, what am I going to do next? And that was really when accessibility was first starting to take off about a decade ago. And so I decided to go into accessibility from there. People automatically assume because I'm a wheelchair user that I got into accessibility because of that, but it was actually because of my daughter. Uh, daughters can be, uh, or children in general, can be very motivating factors in uh, life choices. Absolutely, uh, and, and I think it's, it, it's really interesting to to have that deaf perspective as well on on accessibility because quite often what we see in 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 a lot of web accessibility and I see you on the uh, W3C list as well is there's an awful lot of focus on screen readers so um, having those other perspectives is 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 really important to make sure that we are being fully inclusive. Yeah, well, having a broad perspective is important. Um, but on the flip side, it's a lot easier to make my daughter happy uh, than it is to make somebody who's blind happy. You know, basically, you give her captions, and she won't be 100% happy, but, you know, that's 90% of her battle. Um, a proud, proud mom moment, she's starting her PhD in audiology next week. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And, and this is a child that 23 years ago, people in her school district were questioning whether or not she was going to be able to go to college. So, um, yeah, pretty excited about that. That's a big accomplishment. Congratulations to her and you. Ah, thank you. Fantastic. So um, what would you say are the, 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 the most important things that you're working on right now? Um, so I'm working on a lot of different things right now. Um, and I'm writing about a lot of different things right now. So the one thing that I uh, started with and in, in when I started my blog was I promised not to write anything about how to write better alt text or how to do better header structure uh, because that's been discussed to death. Um, I, I try to discuss, you know, things that keep me up at night uh, from the perspective of accessibility. Um, a lot of it is about just accessibility programs in general. Some of it I get into the weeds, and then occasionally I will just write, you know, something about the perspective of somebody who's a wheelchair user or somebody with a disability. 
Um, I did uh, convince one very significant company to start an accessibility program um, after after one of the rants on my uh, on my blog about how companies that don't provide accessible software are basically preventing people with disabilities from getting employed. Um, that is my motivation behind everything I write one way or the other is, you know, everybody with a disability should have a chance to have the job that they want and the tools that their potential employers have chosen should not be a blocker. So you mentioned, you mentioned at the, uh, early um, in the interview that uh, your, someone in the school where your daughter was, they were not really sure if she was able to reach college, but probably somewhere around the world, there's still a mother or a father who someone is basically telling that same thing to the, uh, about their daughters or sons. So uh, even if she was successful, what would you say to someone that was in that situation that you were 23 years ago today? So when my daughter was born, uh, I knew two deaf people at that time, and one of them was a mail carrier and one of them bagged groceries. Um, so there weren't a lot in the way of role models in my immediate vicinity. Um, I think finding good role models and finding other children that your child can bond with is really important so that your child doesn't feel that they're alone in the universe. Um, so my daughter went to a lot of camps uh, for deaf children, um, and this would have been about 20 years ago, just when instant messaging had started on AOL. And so she was able to stay in touch with those children. In fact, one of them is still a really good friend of hers today, uh, 20 years later. Um, you know, you might think I, I'm going to start a speech about how you can be anything you want to be. Um, I, I'm actually somewhere in the middle. I don't believe that that's a good approach because there are certain things that people are not going to be able to do because of laws. You know, I'm a type one diabetic. I'm never going to be allowed to be a truck driver. If that was my dream, you know, my dream would be crushed. And I think that creates trust problems uh, between people who say that and, and children. So my approach is, you know, if you find a if there's something blocking you from doing something, you know, do everything that you can to find a workaround for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deborah, you have, you want to follow up? Yeah. <clears throat> in, in my question, my um, question is more, um, it's related to the work, your accessibility work with VMware. I know that because I think it's, everything that we're doing with the virtualization and digitalization everything it, it's it's um it, it's very challenging with accessibility because of the moving parts and they're they're so robust and so technical and moving so fast and uh, you know this sherry but years ago when i um owned and i was the ceo of tech access we worked with VMware. And I remember when VMware hired us, which we were thrilled to work with them, we had to set up these servers in our offices. It was just ridiculous, the size and everything. And um, and now everything is in the cloud. So I, I'm curious about, you know, the efforts that it's taking to be accessible when you're dealing with it at with technology moving so quickly and changing so quickly and now it's in the cloud. And, I, and the reason why I bring that up, Sherry, is because I often hear in, uh, especially in the United States by corporations, that the accessibility experts in the field don't really understand the complexity that a very large multinational corporation has to deal with. And it seems to me that VMware has even more technical challenges, maybe because you had said before we went went on air that of the Fortune 500, what 498 of them are your customers at VMware. So this is a lot of data, a lot of data. So I was just curious, you know, how do you even begin that? So the cloud has made things both easier and harder. Uh, the most important thing I think is that you have to start with an accessible tech stack. You have to make sure 
uh, that the tools that you're using to build your software can be made accessible. Um, and so it, it, it's in the end, it's still just HTML. Uh, everything we do is a web interface. And so it, it is possible to make everything accessible. The virtual terminals are a little bit more different. Um, of course, you can't actually test in a virtual uh, terminal. For example, if I have a Mac Windows running inside of a PC, um, if I run voiceover in that Mac window, I'm not going to get the same results necessarily as somebody who's just running on a Mac. So we always make sure that we run our tests on the native environments because we're trying to simulate our customer situation as much as possible. The thing that makes the the cloud and native apps more challenging is we're not on monolithic release cycles anymore. You know, VMware used to be a company where you would have one major release a year and a couple of minor releases a year. And I think every tech company is like that. Oracle's like that, Microsoft's like that. And now you can release ad hoc. And so we've got the interesting challenge of tying uh, automated accessibility tests, for example, into continuous integration build systems, because anybody can check in code at any time. Um, and you want to make sure that uh, somebody's not checking in something that breaks the accessibility of the system. Um, and the, unfortunately, the standards process is a little bit on the slow side, and so it hasn't really taken that into account. We finally just got standards addressing mobile apps um, last summer, uh, which was nine years, I think, after uh, the iPhone came out. I'm hoping it's not going to take that long to get some cloud standards going. Um, so sometimes I'll just reach out uh, to you know various different accessibility professionals and say, well, what do you think about you know this approach or what do you think about that approach? Uh, because uh, there, there's no guidelines uh, that I can point back to for cloud-based systems. Yeah, it, it seems it's it's everything has changed so fast. So it's it, it's interesting that you can't test it in the traditional ways. Well, you want to test it the way your user is going to experience it, um, and so good, that's good the the, the most important thing. Otherwise, your results might not be valid. Um, in the end, we're still testing to the WCAG 2.1 level AA guidelines. It's just how we go about doing it um, has evolved because of, of cloud and native app release cycles. So, and uh, Zimba, oh, go on, Zimba okay. also works with um, a large number of partners, you know, for you know, doing many different cloud integrations. What type of relationship have you established with them uh, to make sure that somehow when you are doing that work, it's easy to integrate and, and make uh, accessibility reliable? So our company comes under Section 508, which has harmonized with WCAG 2.0 level AA. And um, so our partners uh, typically uh, also comply with those standards. If, we, if they don't, we make sure that it's on their roadmap. Um, and then, of course, the other, the other thing that's a challenge uh, that's a little bit of an answer to this question and a little bit of an answer to Deborah's question before is growth by acquisition can be a headache from the accessibility perspective. So um, VMware has acquired, I think, six companies since I started eight months ago. And we typically acquire small companies where accessibility may have not been on their radar. And so, uh, you know, there are specific challenges associated with getting them uh, up to the, the standards that we want to uh, have them at. Uh, remediation is always more difficult than, than having something be born accessible. You know, when it's born accessible, it's designed into the system, it's tested from the get-go, um, and at the end you have something that's hopefully both usable and accessible. Um, when you're remediating, it's it's more expensive and it's more of a retrofit where things might be accessible at the end but might not be optimally usable for somebody uh, who uses assistive technology. And I'm not just speaking about VMware. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, 
just software in general. Retrofitting yeah. is always a bad idea. If it's all you've got, then do it. Uh, but it's always better to make your accessibility uh, prospective rather than retrospective. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And we've, you know, we've had conversations with other large IT companies as well, and they have the same issues with acquisition. Yeah, because it, when you acquire a company, you're buying it for a certain reason. You're probably not buying it because it's making the most accessible software. Um, so, so right, it, you're buying it because there's some feature of their software yeah. that's synergistic with what you're doing. And it's easier and cheaper and faster to buy them than to build it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have to worry about the the the, the integration and the accessibility and everything else. So yeah, we we know that pain. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think one of the things and, and and retrofitting is painful and expensive and all the things you say. And, and the uh, one one thing. I wanted to add was the, the maintenance of stuff that you've retrofitted also is more expensive and more painful than the maintenance of stuff that's born accessible. Yes, I would say that that's true. Yeah. And, so, and you yeah. know, from the UX perspective, I always worry about the usability. Oh, I see uh, WCAG as a floor. It's a starting point. It's not an end goal. Um, and yeah. so uh, I frequently do user research with disabilities um, to find out how we can make the experience better for them. So, uh, you know, I know how to use six different screen readers, but that doesn't mean I use it the way that a blind person uses it. I have the bias of, of being able to see. And so it's, it's just critically important to have your software both tested by people with disabilities um, and then also to get feedback from, from people with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that, that those two groups are, are quite distinct as well because you can have super users. The, the, you know, uh, a, a JAWS tester who is blind is a super user of the software. They're not necessarily a typical user, and so therefore their knowledge of the tool that they're using is so much greater that they're capable of working around stuff that might be actually a real blocker for, for someone else that is less knowledgeable about the tools. Yeah, so we definitely need in our user research a good mix of newbies and advanced users. We also need, surprisingly, and I talked about this with David Fazio at my CSUN uh, talk, you need a good mix of people with congenital disabilities and acquired disabilities. Somebody who became blind as an adult isn't going to have the same experience as somebody who's been blind since birth. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, uh, a stratification factor that we use when we're recruiting people with disabilities. Yeah, no, I think that applies not just to blindness, but in visual impairment, but sure. to deafness uh, as well. I, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, so, I'm picking blindness as an example, but it, it really it does apply to, to every yeah. disability. Yeah, because, you know, I take my, my parents, for example, they're both hearing aid users now. Um, but their attitude towards deafness is totally different to, you know, they don't find, they're not part of the, the deaf community at all. They're, you know, mainly in denial, apart from the fact that they wear hearing aids. Um, yeah. So one of the things I think we're not doing a good job yeah. of in the accessibility community is making sure that we do user research with people with invisible disabilities. Yeah. So um, some of the statistics I've seen are that 70% of disabilities are invisible. You can, you can make software choices that make things better for people with anxiety. You can make software choices for, pe with, you know, for people uh, that are on the autism spectrum or have attention deficit disorder. Uh, so it, it's important to make sure uh, that those don't get dropped in the um, in in the total research plan. Oh, I'm super excited about the the idea of uh, software induced anxiety, right? Because I think that that's something that is massively overlooked. And if we're you know if we're talking about um, some of the, the the barriers to digital transformation right uh, that that anxiety around change and the anxiety that change can bring about um, 
in the world that we're living in now, which is the world of continuous updates and continuous changes and uh, uh, and so on, that that and, and and as Deborah's just put in the message window, real intensity. How do you think we can be better at, at, at mitigating some of that? Because it really is, uh, I think, an issue. People do feel like they're under pressure the whole time. And then if you have an anxiety uh, condition on top of that, the, the technology could be the tipping point. So there's a couple of basic things that you can do to start with. I mean, one of the things that I found uh, at a previous job was that countdown clocks are really stressful mm -hmm. uh, for for people with anxiety. To, um, they also can screw with screen readers if you don't do the the ARIA announcements of the countdown clocks correctly. Um, and so uh, people with anxiety would literally get paralyzed when they see that. They're like, oh my God, I have to make a decision. Oh my God, I have to make a decision. And they would just be in this loop of fear where they couldn't actually break out of it to make the decision. Um, I think making sure uh, that destructive actions get confirmed before they do it uh, is important because uh, you need to make sure if somebody's making a change that can't be reversed from, uh, that, that they know uh, that they're doing it before they do it since it's not reversible. Obviously, making things reversible <laughs> would be the first choice, but that's, that's not always possible. Um, especially in the in the days of GDPR. So um, th those would be a few starting points. Um, I think good release notes where you tell somebody this is what changed in this release will help relieve anxiety about, oh, is the whole thing uh, completely different? Am I going to have to learn a whole new user interface? Um, good tutorials uh, are are also helpful for that. Um, also, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, how detailed should announcements be for screen reader users. You know, if you've got a complex table, you might want a fairly lengthy announcement at the beginning, telling somebody how to navigate the table. Um, but if uh, once the person's done it five or ten times, that length of an announcement is going to drive them crazy. Um, and so setting different user experience levels, uh, perhaps associated with the logins, either can be chosen by the user or can be some intelligent defaults can be made by the system, uh, would, would help um, evolve that uh, over time. Um, you know, with respect to anxiety, automatic updates are always a bad idea uh, because they'll come in in the morning and they'll be, oh my God, this isn't where it was when I left on Friday. Um, so being able to turn off automatic updates um, so that you can inspect the release notes and see this is what changed, this is where I'm going to be impacted, or oh look, it's only back-end security patches. They're important, but it's not going to change my experience. Um, yeah. and, and proceed, because people with disabilities are notoriously slow uh, at upgrading. Uh, because of that very reason, they they have a, a, a tech stack that they're comfortable working with and they're afraid, oh, if I upgrade this one little piece in the middle, my whole systems that I completely rely on is going to explode. It's like um, Jenga, you know, the game it where is you like pull, Jenga. The, I've, yeah, I've, pull the bits out. Yeah. Yeah. Software Jenga. Yeah. No, so I, and, I mean, I, I don't. And I don't know anybody who hasn't gotten burned by that, uh, who has a long-standing uh, disability. Yeah. No, I, I. So, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bad in terms of sort of recognizing navigational elements. So the changes in design schema with automatic updates are a nightmare. So. Yeah. Um, um, the, the other thing uh, that I want to raise is the socioeconomic factor. So we're not talking about updates just about software. We're talking about updates. Well, we're not talking about updates about free software. We're also talking about updates to paid software where you may have to pay maintenance or uh, an upgrade fee um, or devices because, you know, iPhones are up to $1,100 now U.S. Um, and so because people with disabilities are more likely to be in a lower socioeconomic strata, they're also less likely 
uh, to do upgrades that have to be paid for or hardware upgrades. Um, and they're also less likely to have 5G bandwidth. So you need to make sure, again, test in the environment that your user is experiencing. Make sure you test with um, low network bandwidth and, and older devices. Um, I've actually been known uh, to buy older devices off of eBay uh, uh, that people have, have swapped into to Apple or Google or Samsung uh, for the newer devices just so that I can get access to the older devices and the older operating systems to test on. My finance department usually doesn't like it when I expense something from eBay, but uh, when I explain it, usually it goes through okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can understand that, and I think it's, it's really important because the, the other thing is, is that quite often you, um, that lower socioeconomic bracket, which a lot of people with disabilities sit in, um, you end up with secondhand tech. You're, yep. getting, you're getting your, your mother or brother's you know, hand-me-down phone. Um, and that that naturally means that you're going to have a, an older version of the operating system, you know. So it's and and the temptation for developers is, you know, we're going to test with latest versions, and we're going to make you know all of the latest and greatest features, which rely on all of these things that are in you know iOS 11 plus, and you know the latest version of of Android, um, and you know, the, the, those older operating systems, they're going to upgrade them anyway. Don't worry about them. You know, they can, they can upgrade. So I think it is, it is really important because the, the people that are most dependent on the tech aren't necessarily on those latest versions, as you've pointed out. Yeah, they I think can Deborah's always upgrade, question. I think, yeah. is kind of a throwaway ableist comment from yes. somebody who really doesn't understand the issues that are facing people with disabilities. Um, you know, one of the first things I do whenever I go into a new company or where, whenever I'm talking to somebody new about accessibility, even if I don't work for that company, is you have to have a supported platforms matrix. You have to really understand what it is that you're saying works and everything else is your mileage may vary. And you can't rely on them having the most uh, up-to-date version of the operating system. You know, I'm really excited about iOS 13 because of the new accessibility features that they've added, but that doesn't mean you can give up on iOS 12 because people are going to be on it for a long time. I still miss iOS 6. <laughs> Must not go that far back. <laughs> the only reason is because actually um, flat design is really, um, was, was a painful transition. So uh, the transition from skeuomorphism to, to flat design was was actually really quite difficult for a lot of people like me with, uh, who are neurodiverse. Um, it's just harder to work out stuff. And, and, and likewise, that sort of the update tax that you pay when, when you've downloaded that automatic update and someone's updated all of the icons so they look different and skinny or, or whatever, um, you know, is it's 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 something that that uh i think we 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 we're learning to live with it doesn't mean that we're necessarily happy about it so it's great that you're raising that awareness yeah it's it's not always possible because when you're using software in the cloud somebody else is controlling the updates but you should always be able to control the updates on your own devices and your own laptops um, in terms of, uh, you mentioned this, uh, the skeuomorphic icons and the icons changing. The, the, the update in WCAG 2.1 that I was most excited about was the requirement for the color ratios to be met for the keyboard focus indicator and the mm -hmm. activatable icons. Uh, because I have glaucoma and because I'm a keyboard only user, it used to drive me crazy uh, to try to find the focus indicator and somebody would say well it's there i can see it and i'd be like yeah but i can't yeah yeah no that's 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 a huge point um and yes i lose the focus indicator even even still so um yeah big update so um we need to also um thank the people that keep us going on a weekly basis, MicroLink, Barclays Access, MyClearText, they are supporting us over the years, giving us the, the access to captions and everything else. So thank you to, to all of you guys for supporting us. Sherry, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. 
I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have on Twitter. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Good job, Sherry. Okay.